Welcome to Meet the Author at the Apple Store Regent Street in London. Would you please welcome our guest moderator, journalist and broadcaster, Boyd Hilton. Thanks. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here to uh, talk to uh, one of the funniest and most interesting people around. And part of my job, um, my, my daily job really, is to read uh, famous people's memoirs and autobiographies. And uh, I've read them all, you know, from Michael Caine through to Katie Price um, and everyone in between. Um, and I have to say that this one is definitely one of the funniest and most insightful and most original um, memoirs or whatever it is. It's a mix of all kinds of things as we'll find out soon um, from, from a famous person I've read in a long time. So let's um, meet the author, David Mitchell. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Brought a jacket in case it gets cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Forward thinking as ever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, there are loads of famous people's celebrity memoirs, autobiographies every year now. So it's a, it's a kind of autumn comes round, mm. um, and they're all there, dozens yeah. of them. Was this a kind of book that you had in mind yourself that you thought I want to write this about my life and that walk around and all the different things you've got elements you've got in it, or did it was it put to you by an agent and a publisher? How did it come about? Um, it was it w well I started I'd never written any sort of prose before before I started doing this uh, uh, I initially did a sports column in the Guardian and then yeah. I do a column in the Observer and I was slightly surprised to find out that I actually liked that sort of writing. The, the only previously the sort of writing I'd done, other than essays at school, had been sketches written mm. l largely with Robert Webb or with other people, where you sort of sit at a computer, but with someone else there, and you sort of improvise the lines. And there's someone else to make you not wander off and go to the pub or watch television. And um, so I was, I was surprised to find I quite liked this process. And um, and and then you know my I've got a book agent and he said would you be interested in in writing something yeah. about yourself and I and I said well I don't know really whether I'd want to because I think a my life is quite boring and b I'm quite dip, uh, quite uh, repressed and so maybe I you know m maybe yeah. I shouldn't but uh, maybe I could put something together that was sort of about my attitude to mm. the world mm. and you you know because I like banging on about my attitude to the world. I don't like to talk about actually myself. Right. Let's your opinions, you're happy to yeah, hold deflect yes. attention for myself and yeah. have me pointing at other people and saying what's wrong with them. Yes. Um, and so that, that was what I sat down to try and write. Yeah. Um, but it turned out I'm a lot more interested in myself than I thought. Yeah. And so a lot more of the book is ab about me. And it turned out I, I essentially pointing at other people and saying what's wrong with them and what's wrong with the world and what annoys me. I felt wasn't something I could justify doing unless sure. I sort of uh, came clean about the point of view from which that's written. Okay, fair enough. So and at what point, because it has got this unusual um, structure where it's built around a walking, uh, walk around London yeah. basically, mm. from where you live in Kilburn yeah. um, to TV Centre. Yeah. Um, wh at what point did that arrive as an idea? And did, you know, did the publishers go, yeah, that's brilliant, or did they go, oh, God, no, you're mad? Well, I, I, um, that's the idea of some sort of uh, odd way of structuring it came quite early when we were talking about it. And I thought, because it, when I was thinking, oh, I actually don't want to talk much about myself, but I, you know, I, though I, so I thought, okay, well, the autobiographical element could be just a day. Mm. So I am, it is autobiographical, but it's yeah. an autobiography of a specific day. And the little elements of this day, c you know, I can spin off and talk about other things in my life and the things that annoy me and uh, the things that please me and yeah. all that and do it like that. And so it came from the idea of it being a, a day. Um, but then, you know, I, I think I, I was probably on my walk when I thought, hang on, this is a slightly odd thing I do. I do a walk every day yeah. for an hour because I had a bad back and it, uh, you know, that, that w everyone said that was a good thing to do for a bad back, which it is, by the way. Um, so I uh, so I thought well ha well hang on that's that's the a perfect way of structuring sure. it and, uh, and, a, and a perfect way of sort of linking and also the bit of London uh, Kilburn where I, I don't live in Kilburn now I've moved but I I l Kilburn where I then lived is near to where I live now it's near to where I lived before then so sure. a walk around that area and a walk that goes past Broadcasting House and to Television Centre actually 
brings in so right, many yeah. things that have uh, absolutely have so many autobiographical landmarks for my life. So. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's got a very freewheeling quality to it. I think that in 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 the sense that you will literally, you know, you're, it's, it's kind of written in the present. So you are on this walk and you spot something, you spot a shop, you spot Marks and Spencer yeah. and talk about the pants and all of this. And then you weave in a story from your youth and then go back out. It kind of flits around all, all over the place. Was mm. that, did that end up being almost more difficult for you to kind of keep hold of and make sure everything you wanted to say was said and make sure all the different stories you wanted to tell were told? Or did that work? Well, I th the, th the slight cheat is that in general, yeah. I remember things on my walk in broadly chronological uh, order, okay. right. which isn't actually something that happens to the human brain. Right, no. I don't, uh, you know, I think. No. Uh, so I, I did sort of slightly cheat. And it does jump around slightly, but, yeah. but um, yes, basically, I, you know, yeah. when I'm leaving my flat in Kilburn, I'm thinking about my childhood. And, yes, you know, when I'm true. getting to television centre, I'm thinking about my life around now so because yes. uh, i thought without that it would just be a bit insane yeah, yeah. um you do talk about your child as being boring and you kind of you know in in, in you're you're self-aware of the fact that it's not the most eventful um, yeah. it's not a misery memoir you kind of make fun of yeah, yeah. comparing yourself to misery memoirs but did you were you confident that you could make that that would be funny in itself that you're kind of middle class fairly nice parents all of that would would make a kind of interesting crux of a book i think confidence the wrong word <laughs> yes. i i think i sort of hope that yes. um and i think that the first draft of the book i i think i sort of wrote my way into it and in the first draft of the book i wrote a hell of a lot no more about my early childhood than ended up in the book and i think i definitely in that draft put far too much about it right. but it was sort of part of that was part of that process was finding the, the voice with which i sure. write the rest of it um so I so I sort I sort of looked at you know t I suppose sixty thousand words banging on about my <laughs> childhood and teens and decided do you know what I reckon this might be interesting up to about thirty five thousand words right. and we should uh, delete yes uh, the rest. There uh, was some suffering in your childhood. I'm thinking particularly of your um, relationship with food in in your first in your early years when that astonishing bit where you talk about how the teachers used to force you to eat. And if they, they mm. want you to eat everything on the plate, everything that you were served to you at lunchtime in school, and you, you had to, and then you yeah. would literally be sick, well, the and they wouldn't let you clean up or anything like that. that I was shocked and st appalled by They that. were really horrible. And, and obviously, that I was sort of four or five years old, and I'd never been to another school, so I thought, well, this seems to be what happens. And yeah, they had, had a rule. You had to have some of everything at lunch. You couldn't say, oh, I don't like that. You had no. to have some of it. And, if you, uh, and then you had to absolutely eat all of it. And, and, you know, and I'd be able to do that now, uh, unless you're allergic <laughs> to something as an adult for, you know, in order not to create a scene at a failing dinner party, you can shove anything in your mouth. Yeah. I don't mean that in a sex <laughs> way. But, um, uh, but as a child, you sort of can't. Things that no. you don't like are utterly disgusting. And, yeah, that it would make me throw up and I'd sort of have sick down me. And, they, and the attitude of the quite Victorian uh, teachers was, well, you shouldn't have thrown up, you shouldn't have been so ungrateful for the, the bountiful <laughs> gift of not starving. Yeah, Which was a sort of an element of my child. I never quite got the... I, I mean, maybe I'm a naturally presumptuous uh, person, but when, it, when you had to sort of do a prayer, like for what we were about to receive, maybe we'd be truly thankful. And I sort of, I would always think, well, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't ask to exist. No. And I am four. I mean, I, you sort of, if someone doesn't give me food, I'm fucked. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah. so I, I'm, I don't actually feel that grateful to my parents that they're providing me with meals. No. I think that's, frankly, the, the least they should do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah. And and but your poor parents had to pick you up from school and you would be literally caked in, in vomit still from I mean, the uh, on, on time instant. On several occasions, I would, yeah, have, you know... I don't want to, it's not only about vomit. I don't no, want to there's, there's, there's quite a there's small a section on yeah, vomit, but yeah. um, but it's, it was extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. Did your did your when your your family not not just your parents were read? Mm. Did you give them the stuff to read that involved them? No, I didn't. No, okay. No, but I think I was quite oh, nice no, about absolutely. them. Absolutely. So yeah, I, th yeah. I thought they'd be. But you know, you ask for too many editorial influences, <laughs> you'll get them. Yes. You know? <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah. They'll I just wonder say, why didn't you, why didn't you mention Sports Day? Right. My mum might say, oh, yeah, well, no, I don't want true. to. That's why it's my book. <laughs> Yeah, Write your enough. own book about <laughs> Sports Day. Yeah. Well, yeah. even when you, there's, a, there's a lovely builds a lovely chapter about your wife at the, at the end. Mm. Even then, you didn't give it to your wife to read to th think. Oh, is this okay? Because you're talking uh, about your your I, kind of life. I did give that ah. chapter to her. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, 
And what did she and say? She was, she was happy. She was very pleased uh, with it. Any changes she wanted to make? It's very... <laughs> <laughs> no, she said, she said, I couldn't possibly... Uh, she said she thought it was a very nice chapter. She yeah. was... And she said uh, I wouldn't... He wouldn't change any of it. Yeah. So. I should say as well, there's a bit, because you do talk about um, uh, all kinds of incidents in your life when you became famous. And there is a, there's a mention, I work for Heat magazine, I have to come clean. And you do mention that w when we had a picture of a photograph of you um, snogging a woman in the yeah. street one night, mm. which was uh, embarrassing for you. And, and yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm apologising now. Well, I, thought, well, thank yeah. you. I don't think you were the photographer. I would, no, I don't. I, you know, no, I, no. <laughs> but that kind of thing must have been weird, yeah. you, weird for you to get used to. It was part of the, you explaining getting used to being famous and getting used to people. Yeah. Recognising all of that. That was quite traumatic, a strong word, but fairly that was a That was a not, that was a very embarrassing thing. And, yeah. and I did sort of reflect at the time that I, you know, I, I, was in no way, <laughs> I've never been anything like a sort of Russell Brand figure. No. I've had very few relationships in my life. You know, I've, yeah. you know, really sort of hardly ever had a girlfriend, quite, uh, you know, quite lonely and repressed yeah. a lot of the time. Now I'm very happily married. I, n I don't know how that happened. I feel incredibly lucky. But at that point, I sort of think, I'm surely I've got a, a higher percentage of my life snogs must have been put in the media than <laughs> anyone else yes. who's ever lived. Yeah. Yeah, it was you know. unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. But um but then I you know and uh, I learned from that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and you and you learned I've to not never just kissed <laughs> since. <laughs> in public. Yeah. <laughs> in public. <laughs> on, a, on a Soho street <laughs> or like, wherever the hell it was. Yeah. Um in terms of like what you what you kept and what you didn't, I mean there's lots of stuff about um uh your kind of teen days about building your, in your, your interest in going to university and you're kind of becoming um, an unashamedly quite um, intellectual young man, I think it's fair to say, and your, all your interests and all that kind of stuff. Did oh. you, were you kind of aware of depicting yourself in a certain light? Do you know what I mean? Like, did you want to like say, I know what you think I am mm -hmm. when you watch me on TV and you know you form an idea of my character, but actually this is what I'm like. Or were you happy to kind of slightly play up to the image we have of you? I, th I think in a way, it was probably less interesting to other people than it was to me. I sort of wanted to... I don't think the image I have is, uh, you know, I I ridiculously inaccurate. It's, no. you know, a caricature, but that's it's, go it's good to have any sort of image. It's, you know, when you do what I do and you go on panel shows and that yeah. sort of thing, you want people to have something to get a handle on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, uh, you know, I, d I don't feel like I've been cornered into something that's totally contrary to my nature. So, um, so it's fine. But I, th I think I did probably want like you know, like anyone, <laughs> I sort of, I, I wanted to nerdily clarify yes. exactly in what ways I was a nerd, right? And uh, and in what ways I was partial, in what ways I wasn't quite as partial as you might think I was. Exactly. But still, I'm basically partial. I think you know, yeah. And yeah. probably most people would read that bit and go, you yeah. know, that's, it's your problem. Yeah, no, maybe. You know. <laughs> yeah. They're interesting moments. So there's an interesting bit where you do, I mean, you get you get into the big issues of religion and faith, where you mm. talk about how you're an agnostic and you're not an atheist. And you're quite annoyed and angered by atheists. Um, <laughs> so I was quite surprised by. It. Well, yeah, but uh, well I think p one of the reasons, um, you know, I'm not personally annoyed by atheists, but um, a lot of people assume I'm an yes. atheist and yeah. sort of draw no distinction between being an atheist and an agnostic. And there's a sort of, um, particularly among, you know basically rational comedians like me there's a lot of atheism Indeed. going on yeah. and uh and i don't i don't accept the argument that atheism is the most rational response to the world as we see it i think agnosticism is and i also uh, i don't w i don't want there to be nothing no i'm not convinced there's no. something but I, w I do want there to be something i want there to be an all-powerful benevolent god and I, l I like that thought, and yeah. I was initially brought up with it, and now I'm not sure. Yeah. But I'm not ready to reject it, and I'm not, and I, I'm suspicious of the disdain for people who find that a comfort in their lives, and the sort of desperation among some atheists to tear that comfort away from them. Yeah. And the yeah. argument given for that is that religion has caused lots of killing and pain, mm. and I dispute that because so much killing and pain was done in the name of, you know, communism or fascism. Th there's, humans have killed humans in the name of anything, Absolutely. whether it's religious or political or whatever. Humans just like to kill each other. Yeah. Um, and they'll use religion as an excuse, and they'll use politics as an excuse, and they'll use freedom as an excuse. But the idea that you take away one of the excuses that the killing will suddenly stop happening, I think, is absurd. Mm. What you take away is the comfort that a lot of people have as they face the possibility of oblivion. On a lighter note, 
<laughs> um, you don't like Lord of the Rings either. No, I don't like Lord of the Rings. Yeah. No, I, I, um, I quite I mean, like... I'm fully with you on this one. This is, this is yeah. one of those moments where... Cause you, know, you, you do express... It, a lot of opinions are, are, are kind of dropped in yeah. throughout. And every now and then there's one I might kind of punch the air. And this was, <laughs> a, for me, Lord of the Rings, an astonishingly tedious and overrated book. And, and yeah. you definitely don't like it. No, and I don't like it because I... I you know, I tried to read... I read The Hobbit. I thought that was all right. Yeah. Then I tried to read the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And I saw it at the age of about 11. And I sort of petered out halfway through the two towers uh, you know having yeah. and god knows how many books i will never have read because of the time it took me to crawl halfway through that book yeah. and i felt filled with self-loathing that this apparently great thing i i wasn't getting what was great mm. about it and then later on you react to that and say no i wasn't not getting what was great about it it's boring <laughs> it's meaningless and its fans take it absurdly seriously yeah absolutely full agreement by the way yeah. Uh, after my, I ask all my uh, incredibly insightful, fascinating questions, I'll, I'll throw it open to you guys mm. for the last 15 minutes. So do be thinking of, uh, of anything you want to ask David. And also, we should say that the book is available now on, in the iTunes store, and you can get the audio book. So the audio book is astonishing, because mm. that's like the whole thing. It's about nine hours, which you had presumably had to read out over a I'd couple uh, of days. Yeah. How was that for you? That was, it, was two, it was two long days right. le listening to me talk about myself. Yeah. Um, which that's not that's not a great <laughs> quote for the cover, is it? Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was it was it was it was bizarre to sort of read the whole yes. thing through in yeah. in one go. And I can imagine. But yeah. you know, I'll be honest, I quite enjoyed it. Yeah, good, I didn't good. think this is shit. No, I thought. No. I thought well, as a taster right. of what that sounds like, we're going to get David to read an excerpt now. I think so. And this mm. is a, a kind of lobster-based. Um, it is. Yeah. This is a. Thank you very much. This is a bit in the book where. Um, it's so when I'm four years old and I'm ho on holiday with my parents in France and we're staying in this caravan um, and they've not got much money. So everything in the exchange rate's terrible. So everything in France is very expensive. So we're doing a lot of eating in this caravan. Um, uh, and oh, hang on, where are we going? David's going to read it yeah. from an iPad. Yeah, from, yeah. from the, uh, which you, uh, you can get it on the iPad. You, you can also get it on paper, I w I'll say, but <laughs> I know that's... S heresy to say it here, but that is still available for the antiquarians among you. Mm. Um, the other food, so I'm four years old on holiday in France. The other food which I was encouraged to try was lobster. At one point in the holiday, as a special treat and to make up for the fact that they couldn't afford to eat in any of the nice French restaurants, my parents decided to buy and cook a lobster. A lobster that was alive. I know that's the only way fresh lobsters come, but it seemed to me a perverse way to buy food. I was aware of the much of what I ate had once roamed free and careless, but my instinctive response, and one that I stick to, was not to think about it, to avoid contemplating the fact that my dinner may once have been a lovable, cuddly, helpless thing. I discovered that lobsters didn't fall into that category when my parents purchased what I can only describe as a small monster. I'm not saying lobsters are evil, the fact that they are hard, cold, spiny, and viciously armed, rather than large-eyed and soft-furred, is not, I realize, a moral failing. It is arbitrary, maybe even prejudiced, that humans tend to lavish affection on fellow warm-blooded mammals, and quite right that those who choose to keep spiders, snakes, and scorpions as pets should not be run out of town as twisted perverts, but respected as animal lovers. But lobsters definitely look evil. And while I admit that I've never met one under conditions likely to bring out, bring out the best in a crustacean, I've yet to see evidence of their goodwill. It is human nature to be repelled by such creatures, just as it is human nature to think quite wrongly that it might be a good idea to cuddle a lion cub. As a four-year-old, I was even more hardline about this than I am now, in this weird country where no one could speak comprehensively and we were living in a strange, stationary, yet wheeled shed, the two people charged with my care had located and purchased a sort of giant aqua wasp, brought it into our cramped living quarters, still alive, and now proposed to make it the focus of dinner. At this point, I would have settled for a croquette potato. But what could I do? I argued, I moaned, but deep down, I figured my parents knew best. They seemed all-powerful and all-knowing which shows how stupid four-year-olds are, because now I realize that they were 31 and broke. When I was 31, I don't think I had a credit card. I was living a student-y existence in a council flat with no candles. 
the idea that with such a brief span on the planet as preparation, they felt able to make a four-year-old, take it to France, and obtain a miniature monster for dinner is breathtaking. Why weren't they just hanging around London getting pissed? And, as if to prove the very point that our four-year-old hero might go on to make 33 years later if he survives his encounter with the monster of the deep, I'm trying to build suspense, it soon transpired that my parents didn't have the first clue what to do with a live lobster other than release it back into the wild via a long, agonising and smelly death in a bin. Actually, that's not fair. They had several clues, as I imagine you do, if you're one of the many people who've never cooked a lobster but have been hanging around in a world where that's the sort of thing some other people do. You'll have vague notions about plunging it into boiling water or maybe sticking a pin into it in a very precise way that kills it but doesn't hurt it or, according to some, agonisingly paralyses it but stops it from wriggling around, which amounts to the same thing. You'll be simultaneously thinking about what's most humane and also what might preclude getting your finger snipped off by one of the beast's terrifying claws. What they, like you, didn't have was any facts. But they had a secret weapon. My mother is a woman and is consequently able to ask strangers for advice and information. And my father, being a man, is able to sidle up while she does this and vaguely listen. So they formed a plan. They would ask the French couple in the caravan next door how you cook a lobster. Brilliant. My parents don't really speak French. There is no transcript of their exchange with the French couple, but having concluded it, they return to the caravan firmly of the opinion that the way you cook a live lobster is to put it straight in a pan of cold water, making no attempt to poke it with a pin or anything, and slowly bring it to the boil. When I've told people about this since, reactions have varied. Some say, oh my God, how barbaric. Some give a nervous, oh, right, in expectation of the horrors to come. Others say, didn't they mean boiling water? Don't you plunge it in boiling water? And still others say, yes, that is how you cook a lobster. I've noticed that responses of the last kind go up proportionally to the age and life experience of the people I'm telling the story to. Therefore, sceptical though I've long been of the French couple's knowledge and my parents' linguistic skills, I'm forced to contemplate the possibility that that is genuinely how you cook a lobster. If so, let me tell you, it's no picnic. No idiomatic picnic. It may circumstantially be a picnic, but one which you'll come away from humorously saying, that was no picnic. <laughs> If you do, may that shaft of levity help you come to terms with the horrors. The caravan was narrow. At one end, there were two bedrooms, the bathroom and the door to the outside world. At the other, the main seating area. In between were the galley kitchen and dining table booth. This formed a bottleneck. You could only walk on one side, the galley kitchen side, of the table if you wanted to get out. This wasn't usually a problem. See map. There's a map. My mother was twitchy from the start and hovered as nervously over my father's shoulder while he put the lobster into the saucepan as he would over hers if she'd asked a stranger about local restaurants. She remem uh, about local restaurants. She was, I remember clearly, on the door side of him and the hob. I wasn't. I was in the sitting room bit. At this stage, the creature was docile, no doubt traumatised by having been out of the water for a while. Consequently, on arriving in the pan, it relaxed. This has been a weird day, it was probably thinking, and things are still far from normal. But this water, albeit undersalinated and in an unfamiliar, steely environment, is definitely an improvement. Tell you what, if that what the lob... Is that what's the lob... I tell you what, if that... I can't fucking read. <laughs> I tell you what, if that really is what the lobster was thinking, I'm never eating white bait again. Why can't you spare a thought for the poor creature? You're probably screaming at the page by now. I'm sorry, you're right. Above all, this was a bad day for the lobster. I accept that intellectually. I just couldn't feel sorry for it at the time. It looked too alien and terrifying, too nasty. I was too frightened to feel mercy. Also, I ate meat. I always have, and I suspect I always will. As incidents where you're brought face to face with the reality of that go, the demise of a heavily armoured, dark, eyeless, snapping creature is a lot less likely to make you reach for the nut roast than seeing a bewildered and affectionate lamb gamble past a mint sauce factory towards some rotor blades. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. You don't know what happened yet. The lobster might win. 
So the lobster's in the pan, my father's at the stove, my mother hovering by his side, I'm in the sitting area moaning about this whole ill-conceived plan, and the calla has just been ignited under the crustacean's new home. This is the calm before the storm, the phony war. <laughs> the spell is broken by the lobster. It has begun to smell a rat. My parents had added one for flavour. Not really, I'm speaking metaphorically. The lobster is starting to suspect that the apparent improvement in its fortunes was no more than a dead cat bounce. It's massively into animal metaphors. It has noticed that the water has begun to get warmer. I don't remember the details of the next few minutes. I assume my dad held onto the pan as the lobster inside moved around in an inquisitive, then concerned, then agitated, and finally enraged and panicked fashion. I only remember the last stage. The pan is now full of very hot water, and the lobster is throwing everything into a dramatic bid for escape. The, fo the phony war is well and truly over. My mother breaks like the Maginot line and runs out of the caravan. I would gladly follow her, but my father, struggling with a boiling hot pan containing an enraged mini monster, stands in my path. I make a few hesitant steps towards him, and a furious and steaming claw flails from under the saucepan lid, sending searing splashes everywhere. A droplet lands on my knee. I know with all my heart, with a terrible, chilling certainty, that the creature wants me dead. <laughs> there will be no appeasing it if it escapes. I refuse to eat any of the lobster. I think I'm making a point, but I imagine my parents were happy enough to polish it off themselves. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about all the misfits. <laughs> <laughs> That's lobster for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I will throw it open to the audience in a minute. I have to ask you about, we're in the Apple store, mm -hmm. um, surrounded by wonderful Apple products. You, at one point, you and Robert, were the faces of Apple advertising, yes, as you yeah, mentioned yeah. in the book. And you yeah. got quite a hard time for that, just for getting involved in advertising, I guess. What, and and yeah. you quite rightly explained, well, you just thought it was part of the job. Yeah, well, yeah, we did get, I think you get a hard time, as a comedian, I think you get a hard time for doing any sort of advertising. Mm. Um, uh, I, you, I don't think it was because it was Apple. I think Apple's no. quite a, a, you know, a cool product to advertise, but... Um, but people don't like comedians to advertise, um, which, which is annoying. Yeah, frankly, yeah. I, I don't. I've got. I'm the only. Re I, I wouldn't advertise a project product that I thought was immoral. No. But basically, I wouldn't buy a product if I thought it was immoral. So it, if I'm happy to trade with a company by buying something from it, I'm happy to trade with Absolutely. it by selling my services to it. Yeah, yeah. And that's my yeah. argument. Yeah. But practically speaking. You know, a, a lot of comedians avoid advertising because you get a lot of shit for it. They get a lot of shit for it. Yeah. And you talk about also how comedians get a lot of shit in general. Com comedy fans are very obsessive and they're very, and you talk about, very I thought it was very interesting. You talk about the idea that they like, when they're the early adopters of people like you, of people, comedy yeah. talents, and then once you go mainstream, that her terrible word, and less cool, another terrible word, they kind of go off you and they start criticizing you. And that's yeah. a kind of common odd thing, isn't it? Particularly about comedy, that they kind of get very judgmental <laughs> once you become famous and well successful. I think sort of, I mean, I'm, sh I'm, I'm sure that happens in the music industry as well. Um, I'm, it probably happens in lots of areas, but it probably happens in modern art. Maybe. You know, when, you know, when I'm modern, I'm sure a lot of people yeah. say about Grace and Perry, you know, other people have heard of him now. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, I think well, the thing about our tastes in sort of music and art and culture in general is that they're a thing we use to define ourselves. They're not actually yeah. just a thing that we enjoy. Absolutely. So when people are using you to define themselves as an, a person who quirkily likes this thing and as part of a small group that likes this thing, then their identity is threatened when that thing becomes more popular. It's not logical that their identity no. is threatened, but I think that's how people feel, and I think that's where the anger against going mainstream comes from. And yeah. then they ascribe any changes to the material that the person's doing to this move to the mainstream rather yeah. than to anything that they might have sincerely artistically wanted to express. No, absolutely. But it does annoy cool. The idea of cool does annoy. That's a kind of ongoing thing. Oh, oh yeah, no, the, the idea of cool does, does annoy me. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, I, d I don't think I can put a stop to it. No. But, uh, but it's it's a it's such a it's a fright it's frightening the way that word has you know uh, has changed and and is is used everywhere. That yeah. cool is used as a synonym for good. Yes. 
really a lot of the time. I mean, even colloquially in the expression, yeah, I'm cool with that. You know, that means yeah. I'm okay to that. I consent with that to Absolutely. that. And, and that's very damaging because being cool, it's, you know, largely a positive thing, but it's not a very positive thing. And it's a transitory thing and it's a superficial thing. Yeah. And it's a damaging uh, development for our society that sort of superficial popularity, the word that means superficial popularity, it has become a word that just means generally good and worthwhile. Yeah. Um, well, we're surrounded by uh, non-cool people in a good way <laughs> here. Uh, and let's throw it open to uh, cool, non-cool, whatever. I'm not but you see, you can't say non-cool no, I know, people I know. I'm, I'm, because that means you're that, just saying that's everyone. like saying yeah. bad people. I know. But, um, I know. Um, because people sort of say uh, it's cool not to care about being cool. Yeah. You say that, that, no, it isn't no. cool not to be yeah. to be cool. You have yeah. to care about being cool. The people who are really yeah. cool, they really care about that. And remember that because that diminishes them. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> so, any questions, for David? Hopefully, you've got a roving mic somewhere so that you'll be able to be heard when this. Uh, there's a gentleman in the back that I've really annoyingly for the mic person gone for in the middle. Uh -huh. He was first with his hand up, right in the middle. There we go. Hello, David. Hello. Um, are you surprised at how quickly uh, the unbelievable truth has become a stalwart of radio comedy, BBC radio comedy, joining things like, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue, and just a minute. It seems to be one of the, the tent pegs that the Radio 4 schedule is built on now. Um, oh, very nice of you to say so. Um, I, I, I love doing the unbelievable truth, and I'm, I'm with, as a show, very grateful that we get sort of scheduled like the other main radio panel shows and um i you know i'm I, I think john naismith and graham garden who came up with the format are very clever men so i you know i thought from the start this is an idea that could run and run but i'm very pleased nevertheless that it's run for as long as it has and i've definitely with radio four things you've, i've definitely got my eye on doing that when i'm 90 you know and, and being a real you know a, a real sort of demented embarrassment on that show <laughs> that can't be moved, <laughs> saying things that make no sense at all. And people think, ah, oh, yeah, but he's, he's been doing it since, you know, before the last four wars, you know. So, uh. Yes, thank you. Good question. A uh, gentleman here in the front. Hi. Um, Hi. Some people say that exercise can get almost addictive, and your book is largely about exercising. Um, and a lot of people, like any addiction, want to go to a whole new level. I was wondering if you might push this a bit further, doing Nizard and like doing marathon every day or something <laughs> at some point. I don't think uh, I that I don't think exercise addiction is a problem that uh, <laughs> I'm. I'm susceptible to, but maybe this is the moment of complacency that, that's very dangerous. And in fact, now you've said that, I'm going to keep an eye on my exercise habit and make sure it doesn't get out of hand. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I don't want to ever run a marathon. I think it's very, very bad for you to run 26 <laughs> miles. I think, I think training to be able to run 26 miles is probably good for you, but then actually to run 26 miles, I think that's, yeah. that's just, yeah. that's longer than you it was only done by that guy because there was important news about a battle that's you know <laughs> that was a one-off he wasn't he didn't mean to invent a sport <laughs> you know uh, thank you a lady here in the second row uh, i'm interested in your recollection of your young years i've got a seven-year-old grandson who thinks mm. he's weird <laughs> <laughs> suggestions for easing self-doubt what would have helped you what would have helped me feel like i was less weird I don't know. I think I don't. I th I think that I don't think it, I, I I have no real suggestions about that. I definitely felt as a small child. I felt I was worried that I was um, not into, you know, sport more and football more. I didn't feel like I liked the right things. I liked sort of dressing up as Doctor Who and watching television. I didn't want to go camping and learn how to tie knots or get swimming badges or all these things. Um, uh, but there are sensible reasons why children are encouraged to do the sort of more the things I didn't like and are discouraged from... I was never discouraged from dressing up as Doctor Who. I was discouraged from watching television endlessly. So um, I don't know. I suppose you, you could say to him, look, it's, it's good to be weird. The we we're, uh, this is a society that celebrates the weird. You know, We've avoided the word weird. Sorry? We've avoided the word weird. But yes, probably avoid the word. <laughs> I would say... I'd say only use only use the word weird if he brings it up. It would definitely yeah. be this sort of thing. Don't don't <laughs> as a starting point, though. You're not weird. <laughs> yeah. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Just there. Hi, David. Hi. Um, I think your book's great. Um, Thank you very much. I particularly much. like your university years. Um, my question is, having published the book now, is there anything you wish you'd included in it um, at all? Uh, you, say, you tell some fantastic stories, like the lobster. Um, is there anything poignant now that you find you, you wish you had included or that's happened now that you wish you'd written about? I think there are... Um, I, th I keep sort of remembering sort of bits of my childhood that I that sort of ha didn't really occur to me while I was writing the book, the sort of friends I had, ti you know, fun times and that sort of... And part of me wishes I'd made reference to them just in case those people r read the book and I wouldn't want them to think that I don't remember and I didn't have a nice time then. Um, but, but, but basically there's no sort of big aspect of my life and the influences on it that I feel I missed out. I, you know, I, I don't feel I... I've got, oh, you know, damn, I forgot to say about all the mountain climbing. <laughs> it's, you know, so no, no big thing. But occasionally I sort of go, oh, yeah, I never do it. You know, that was like a big, you know, f friend of mine. We spent two years together putting on little plays. And I remember particularly the neighbours of mine from, uh, they, they sort of uh, lived next door to my parents for two years. They came over from Canada and got on very well with them for two years. And we put on little plays in, in the garden and that sort of thing. But then they moved away and... I've not kept in touch, and and I, I've thought a few times. I wish I'd mentioned them, um, but uh, but I didn't. But okay. the sequel. Mm. Maybe. Yeah. There's a, le oh, there's a lady standing up there in green. Um, can we get the mic? So she's quite near the mic. Can I shout? Oh yeah. There's, oh, a, mi no, the there's a mic. Way. It's on yeah. way, don't worry. We're very clever. Yeah. There you go. Why are so many? Um, <laughs> Talented comedians, manic depressives. Do you Ooh. have any jokes about manic <laughs> depression? <laughs> um, I, do, I don't know why lots of comedians are manic depressive. I'm not one myself. I, you know, I have moods, but I, I wouldn't say I was in any sense manic depressive or close to it. I don't know, but I think probably, I, th I think, I think probably people who are, have that, uh, you know, problem, are quite driven in in their lives. I think you know, probably disproportionately driven. Um, and so that so they're probably will I, th I think there are probably quite a lot of manic depressive a, a higher percentage of people in positions of prominence are probably manic depressive than as a percentage of the population would be my guess. Um but uh, I know there are probably people who could tell me whether or not that's bullshit. Mm. But you do mention that you do talk about how some comedians are famously manic depressive and or depressed depressive. Yeah. And that maybe because it's such an interesting Dichotomy, they're yeah. asked about it a lot and they'll talk about it a lot, but in yeah. fact, comedians are like everyone else. Well, it, well cer certainly, I mean, I'm, certainly, I think there are, I know I've been into, I, I don't think I, I don't think I'm particularly, you know, I don't think I'm more than averagely moody. Right. Um, and I get down sometimes and yeah. I, but yeah. sometimes, we, but I think that's just what it's like to be uh, relatively normal. But I know I've been interviewed various times and I think uh, some interviewers are yes. keen to ascribe yes. a, a greater, level of mental Im imbalance to you than is perhaps justified. Now, they like to say, where does it come from, the yeah. comedy? Where does it come from? And they like to say, well, it comes from pain. Yeah. And I don't think it really does yeah. come no. from pain. Yeah, it comes from and watching more and more and and Yeah, and, and yeah, it comes from copying other comedians and yeah. getting angry about daytime TV. Yeah. That's, you know, that's... Yeah. You know. And I think we've got time for maybe one or two yeah. more. What, two more. Yeah. A gentleman there. With the beer. Hi, David. Uh, Hi. You mentioned at the beginning that you hadn't really attempted prose on the scale before. Yeah. And I was just wondering, have you been bitten by the prose bug and had thought of maybe following other comedians like Stephen Fry or Adela Hanlon into uh, actual fiction? I, I have thought about that. I haven't, you know, and I think I'd be disappointed if I never did, but I haven't yet put pen to paper. I'm a bit, uh, you know, is one of the things I watch most on television and one of the things I read most, I do love a murder story. Mm. Um, I ju just find it so, rel rel it's interesting to just the right extent. It's sort of like a, a funny quote from, from Peep Show, actually, when in the first series when Jeremy's being interviewed from a dot for a job and he says, yeah, I do want a challenge, uh, just a more relaxing challenge. And I think, um, I think <laughs> as a thing to watch on television or a thing to read, a murder story is a more relaxing challenge. Um, and I'd, I'd love to try and write one one day. And and well, exactly. Try and make it comic, but uh, but also, you know, not not like a slapstick murder. Not like <laughs> everyone bodies everywhere. But um, 
Uh, yeah, I'd, that's something I, I'd be interested to try and write a comic uh, version of. Yeah, oh, that would be good. Yeah. 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 Um, one more one. lady at the end. There. Thank you. Hi. Um, I really love your book. It's one of the most enjoyable things I've ever read. Um, oh, thank you very much. I wanted to ask: Did you have any reservations about publishing it? Because you're quite in putting quite a lot of yourself out there, or was it quite cathartic? Or it w it was definitely cathartic. I sort of enjoyed. I enjoyed writing it very much, and I sort of enjoyed. It, it sort of made sense of things a bit. The f the the fact of expressing it sort of put things in order in my my head a bit. Um, I, and I don't think I I, I think the n the great thing about uh, you know r writing a book like that is that you get to be very careful about exactly in what words you express personal things. You're in complete control of that so I was very happy by the time you know I the, the final draft was in with the way I'd expressed all the personal stuff and that I was I think being honest and candid but not giving more away than I was comfortable with so I was I think I was all right with that yeah. thank you thank you for a great question sorry we've run out of time um, so David's book backstory is available now on iTunes and in bookshops mm -hmm. and on the audiobook and thank you very much for coming and thanks thank to you. David David Mitchell thank, thank you. you very much thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>